Romans chapter 1. Now, last week we talked about a revelation of forgiveness. That tape is available, and I believe if you, if you weren't here last week, I encourage you to get it. It will be a tremendous blessing. What we're going to share today is somewhat connected up with that, but from a slightly different perspective. Amen? Glory to God. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 says, Romans 1 verse 16. Hallelujah. Paul, by the Spirit of the Lord, says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The gospel of who? The gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel of Christ, it is the power of God. The gospel of Christ is the power of God. It is the power of God unto salvation. Now I'm cutting it back a little bit, and it, is, and it would say the gospel of Christ is the power of God. Now think about the power of God for a moment. Think about the dynamite, dunamis power of God that created the heavens and the earth. And, and as you think about the power of God, and the gospel is the power of God, can it be? And if it is that the gospel is the power of God, and you can think of how immense and miraculous and supernatural and infinite the power of God is, then you would have to think, what can the power of God not do? The power of God must have the ability to produce. So the gospel of Christ is the power of God. You would expect that it would have the power to produce. Amen? And it produces salvation. I was translating this verse and I, and, and I, and I saw it this way. The gospel... Is, I may not have written that down, but the gospel is the, the gospel of God is capable of producing salvation when mixed with faith, when mixed with believing, because in it, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. In the gospel, the, 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 the rights of God, God's rights, God's blamelessness, is God blameless? Is God holy? Does God have authority? Well, righteousness, the righteousness of God, the righteousness of who? God. The righteousness of God has to do with God's rights, God's authority, God's power, God's, God's, God's ability, God's blamelessness, God's holiness. All of that is wrapped up in the righteousness. So the gospel is so powerful because in it, righteousness of God is revealed. And because of that, it has this power to produce salvation, deliverance, wholeness, healing, divine protection. It has the power to cause angels to be activated in your life. The gospel is the power of God and it has this awesome ability to produce. No, it is the gospel is the power of God. It flows from him. The power of God. Now, if it's flowing out of God, you would expect that it's coming, that somehow or the other, the gospel is the power of God. There must be a revelation of God in this gospel. Because it's flowing from his heart. It's flowing from the very essence of his being. So somehow, this gospel flowing from the very essence of God must have God all over it. And if it must have God all over it, then it must have a lot of goodness because God is good. It must have glory. Amen? It must have glory. And the Bible calls it in another place the glorious gospel. It must have zoe, the life of God. 
And do you know, do you not know when you are born again, you are partakers of, of what? His divine nature. Isn't that true? So it must have some of that inside. God is full of mercy, isn't he? It must be full of mercy. God is gracious. It must be full of grace. Hallelujah. Isn't it, is it not called the gospel of the grace of Christ? What am I trying to say? It must be full of truth. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We beheld his glory full of grace and full of truth. So the gospel is the power of God with the ability to produce and having the very essence of who God is in it. Think about it. And on man's side, now let me go a little further. Now if the gospel is the power of God, it is the power of God, then some or the other, I believe that the power of God must be such that it's got to be independent of man, man's weakness, man's frailty, man's humanity. It must be independent of man's, of man's, of man's goodness because it's the power of God. All that is required where man is concerned is that he must have faith. He must believe. He must receive. Amen? It is independent of it. And is this not the gospel? Whosoever will? Is it, isn't it about receiving what God has done despite us? I'm talking about the gospel. Amen. Now, if it is dependent, the only way in which man is connected up with this is based on his believing, his right thinking, his believing right. It has to be, it is based on his believing, his, 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 his believing right, his receiving, and his faith. Then it tells me that somehow, from God's perspective, man's believing is more important than man's behavior. I didn't say man's behavior is not important, but believing, right believing is more important than right conduct. Let's put it another way. Um, the right doctrine, believing the right doctrine is more important than right behavior. In other words, okay, let, let, me, put it, let me flip it around. Wrong believing or wrong doctrine is more detrimental than wrong behavior. In the mind of God. Wrong doctrine is more detrimental than wrong behavior. Now this is critical. Matter of fact, this is very critical perhaps to everything that I might say today. Amen? And, and this is where a lot of the problems lie. This same area. Now, but let me, so let me emphasize this point. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to repeat it. Wrong doctrine is more detrimental than wrong believing, than wrong behavior. Because all that God and the gospel and the power of God is asking of us is believe, receive. Are you with me? Amen. Now, to emphasize this point, we find, in, uh, when we compare Galatians, maybe you can put a finger there too, Galatians and 1 Corinthians, in the Corinthian church, there were some problems, okay? The first, the Corinthian church, they had strife, there was envy, there was jealousy, there was a lot of outward wrong moral behavior. There were people going to what was called temple prostitutes. People were, believers were suing one another. Is that right? In court. They were misusing the gifts of the spirit. There was a bunch of other immoral behavior. They were eating food that were sacrificed to idols. They were fighting at the communion table. There was one guy that was living with his stepmother that was having an affair with his stepmother. Isn't those, aren't those things ungodly behavior, bad behavior? That was their problem. 
In the Galatian church, their problem was different. In the Galatian church, Paul had preached the gospel to them, the pure gospel, and after Paul left, there were some other people that came along, some legalists, and tell people, yes, it's nice, you are saved by grace through faith. However, you got to now add some works. You now have to, oh, you got to obey, you, you can't throw away the law altogether. Yes, you're saved by grace, and that's good, but now you have to behave a certain way. Now you have to keep the Ten Commandments. Now you need to get circumcised. And Paul was outraged when he heard about it. Now, look at how Paul talks to these two different people. In other words, then, the Galatian, the Corinthian church had wrong behavior. Say wrong behavior. The Galatian church had wrong doctrine. Now, to the Galatian church, Paul said to them, Paul said to them in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, he says, I marvel, I am appalled that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel. He says, I am shocked. I am disappointed. I, am, I marvel at you. In chapter 3, he says, oh, you foolish Galatians. In other words, you are silly. You are thoughtless. You are unreflected. You are senseless. And then he repeats it. In verse 3 again, you, are you so dumb? Are you so foolish? This is the Bible. This is how he's talking to the people of the wrong doctrine. And he even says, if any man in chapter, chapter 1 it is, or, or is it chapter 1? Where he says, if anyone come to you and bring any doctrine, yeah, that's right, yeah, chapter 1, and pervert, verse 7, and twist the gospel of Christ, in other words, bring some other kind of mixture in, let him be accursed. And then he repeats it in verse 9. Let him be accursed. In other words, Paul is literally pronouncing a curse on anyone that comes and pollutes the pure gospel of grace by bringing in any other, anything else. Are you with me? He says, let him be accursed. You see, what you and I sometimes, what the religious world will call balance. We got to have balance. Yes, there is grace. But we got to balance it with the law. They call it balance. God call it mixture. And God don't like mixture. God says you cannot put old wine in new wine skins. I wasn't, okay, fine. You cannot put, let me just flip over there for a moment. Mm -hmm. In Mark chapter 2 verse 22. Let me just show you this. God calls it mixture. God don't call it balance. If God were to use the word balance, he would mean be accurate. When we use the word balance, we mean compromise. A little bit of this and a little bit of that. Don't go too far over there. Don't go too far over there. Don't go too far with this great stuff. You got to have a little bit of law. Paul said, let him be a curse that perverts the gospel. Paul says, I marvel and I'm shocked that you would, that you would, that you would turn away from the pure gospel of grace and allow this type of mixture. Paul says, how foolish. And by the way, while I'm still in the thought, and by the way, I, I'm going to Mark in a minute, and in the first Corinthians where they had, what did they have in, what was the problem in, in um, Corinthians? They had what? Wrong behavior. Now listen to how he talked to them. He didn't tell them about being accursed. He didn't tell them about, uh, he didn't call them foolish. How do you like being called foolish? He didn't tell them any of that stuff, but you know what he said to them? In fact, he said, I thank, verse 4, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus. He says in verse 7, so that you come behind. These people were misusing the gifts of the Spirit. Paul says to them, you don't come behind in any of the gifts. Verse 8, and God is able to confirm you unto the end that you would be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus. Can you imagine you saying to a bunch of folks that are in strife, envy, moral misconduct, that God is able to conform you to the end and, keep, and make you blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, God has begun a good work, he could finish it. And then he says in verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called on to fellowship, on into the fellowship of his son Jesus Christ. This is how he's talking to the Corinthian church. Amen. And later on, he's going to tell them how they're joined to the Lord and they want spirit with him. What a difference. Why is that? Well, let me talk about the mixture and then I'll come back and answer that question. 
Or as a matter of fact, I'm going to answer it right now. You see, if you've got bad behavior, if you've got a bunch of dirty laundry in the middle of the living room, and it's dirty, and it's piling up, and it's smelling, and it's dirty, and it's piling up, and it's smelling, and you don't wash it, let me ask you something. Is that good? No, that's not good. But if you have a washing machine, a good, proper working washing machine, then even though you've got some dirty laundry, even though you've got some dirty laundry, nevertheless, because you have the washing machine, you've got some hope. Don't you? But suppose you have the dirty laundry, but you don't have a washing machine. Now you really have trouble. Because you know why? At least the washing machine provides some hope for that dirty laundry. In other words then, grace is the washing machine. And the law or all about, all about conduct, that is, that is the dirty laundry. Amen? But the point I'm making here is this. Grace is the solution to the bad behavior. But you remove the grace and guess what? You are stuck in your bad behavior. You have a lot of trouble. You see, the law does not lift a hand to help you. We've talked about that. Can you see that? So God says, God says, you know what? You might think it's balanced, but God says, I hate mixture. I hate mixture. I prefer it that you either be hot or you be what? Cold. If you're lukewarm, I will do what? Spit you out of my mouth. Now let me ask you something. He's talking about the ladies in church in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. Won't you think that if he's talking about their conduct and their behavior, don't you think it would be better if they're not hot and on fire, if they're not hot in their conduct and their behavior, you mean God prefer them to be totally cold and be a total derelict? Why can't, w w I mean, I would think lukewarm would be a little bit better, wouldn't you? Come on. Isn't that right? So what is that all about? What is that all about? You either be cold or you be hot. Here is what it's all about. God is saying, and I trust we'll be able to see this as we go through the message. God is saying you can mix, get the old covenant and mix it with the new covenant. You can get law and mix it with grace. Because what you will do if you mix both of them together, you're gonna, number one, you're going to damage both of them. And what would happen is that you will cancel out the effect of both of them. I would prefer if you just stay with the law completely or you go be totally with grace. Because if you mix both, here's what's going to happen. If you decide, well, all right, I'm going to live by the law, but I'm going to live by a little bit of grace. Then at least what will happen is in the law by itself, if you were living by the law totally, at least that law will show you your sin. The law will show you that even your thoughts are not clean. The law will show you that you are condemned. The law will show you that no matter how much you try, you cannot meet this law. And the law will bring you to the end of yourself and make you recognize, I need a savior. It will be a schoolmaster and bring you to Christ. But when you have a mixture and you have some law, but you have some grace, then well, this might not be too bad. Well, after all, God's grace covers me. And as a result, you bring the, the, the standard of the Lord down to a place where you can keep it. Just like the Pharisees did. And they taught because they were praying loud prayers. And they were giving alms. And because they were, uh, and because they were fasting. And because they were reading their Bible. And they memorized the scripture. They taught their righteousness was valid. Because they brought it down to the level where they think they could meet it. Jesus came to them and said, uh-uh, uh-uh, don't you do that. Jesus said, let me tell you something. If a man just looks at a woman and lusts after her, he's already committed adultery. If a man just has an evil hatred thought against someone, he's already a murderer. And Jesus called him a brood of vipers. And, 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 and they were like empty, they were like tombs with, with rotten bones inside. Isn't that right? Now, they never came to Christ. You know why they didn't come to Christ? They never thought they needed a Savior. You know why? They had the law, but they had gotten all watered down. So Jesus was saying, I prefer that either be totally under the law, at least it will bring you out to Christ, or to be totally under grace. But you can't be both. Look, if you be lukewarm, it's not going to work. Now, in Mark chapter 2, 
and verse 22, it says, No man puts new wine into old bottles. Old bottles represent the law. It's not pliable, it's cracks, it's hard. No man puts what? New wine. Now you know new wine represents the Holy Ghost. And it represents the new, which is the new covenant is the spirit of life. Amen? It's not a letter of the law. And no man putting new wine into old bottles. No man does that. Or else what will happen? The new wine will what? Burst the bottles and the wine is spilled and the bottles are marred. So what happens when you put new wine into old wine skin? The wine gets spilled and get ruined. The wine gets, becomes neutralized. The wine spills and is useless. And the wine bottle cracks and breaks and that's useless. What have you ended up with? All you've done is nullified both of them. Do you see that? So God hates mixture. Amen? Choose ye this day whom ye may serve. Choose life or choose death. Choose grace or choose the law. Choose the spirit of life or choose the spirit of death. The law of sin and death. You follow me? And really that is the choice of the believer. But we've been marred by many things. All right. Let me back, back over here. So my point is, the gospel is about grace and it is the power of God unto salvation. And God, and, and, and according to, to this, uh, from what you can see from the Galatian and Corinthian church, it is wrong doctrine and wrong believing is more detrimental than wrong behavior. Because at least when you have, when you have right doctrine, the Bible says at least when you're thinking right, that could deliver you the grace. Amen? At least the washing machine, you could get the dirty, dirty clothes clean. Titus 2 verse 11 says, the grace of God teaches you to live godly and soberly. Romans 6 verse 14 says, for, the, for, for where, where, um, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Amen? No, 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 sorry, it doesn't say that. That's, that's, that's um, Romans 5 20. Romans 6 14 says, Sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but under grace. You're not under the law, but under grace. You're not under the law, but under grace. In other words then, when sin has dominion over you, if sin has dominion over you, it means grace is not operating. It means you lack a revelation of grace. Now, the gospel is above, is about grace, it's about righteousness, apart from man's doing and man's behavior. Let's look at this. Turn, we, we, uh, we had Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 8. Now the Bible says in Galatians 3 verse 8, verse 7, verse 6, even as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for what? Righteousness. Righteousness. Oneness with God. Having God's authority. Blameless. And you know Abraham was not blameless in his conduct, was he? But yet, God credited him righteousness because he believed right. And the scripture, verse 8, foreseeing that God would justify or declare righteous the heathen, true faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. This scripture says that the gospel was preached unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. The gospel was preached to Abraham saying what? In you shall all nations be blessed. Say blessed. The next verse says, So then they which are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Curse is everyone that continueth not in all the things which are written in the book. Okay, let me jump right down to verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham, said the blessing. The blessing. Now, the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Here is the point. God preached the gospel to Abraham. The gospel that God preached to Abraham was the blessing. It was the blessing and it was the promise of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Holy Spirit 
He died without receiving that. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, 39, and verse 40, that all the Old Testament saints, they died not receiving the promise. What promise? They didn't receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Do you not know the Holy Spirit is the best thing that heaven got? But the Bible says they could not be perfected without us. Glory to God. They had to wait on you and I. They had to wait until Christ go to the cross. But the blessing part, the blessing, Abraham walked in the blessing. Abraham walked in the blessing, said the blessing. All right, now let me just um, flip with me to Isaiah chapter 51. What is the blessing? What is the blessing? Because the blessing has to do with the gospel. Isaiah chapter 51, reading from verse 1. It says, hearken to me, you that follow after what? Righteousness. Remember, Abraham's faith was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham's faith was counted to him as righteousness. Let me go right ahead and says Abraham walked. The Abraham had a covenant of grace. Amen? And, and, and it included righteousness. And it included the blessing, which is the exact same covenant that we have. Plus, we got the Holy Ghost. Say, I got the Holy Ghost. Whoo, hallelujah. We have the Spirit. Amen, that's awesome, you know that? <laughs> anyway, hearken to me, you that follow after righteousness. You that seek the Lord, look to the rock from whence you are hemmed and to the hole of the pit from whence you are dig. Look unto Abraham, your father. Remember, if you be Christ's seed, you are Abraham's seed. You are blessed with faithful Abraham. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon you. In him shall all the nations of the earth come into this blessing. So he says, look to Abraham, you that are pursuing righteousness. Your father and unto Sarah who bear you. I call him alone and I blessed him. I give him the blessing and I increased him. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. Now watch this. And he will make her wilderness like Eden. Say Eden. How beautiful you think Eden was? Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. How awesome was Eden? Man, Eden had rivers that flowed, that, that went to a place that had gold. Eden had no sickness, no disease, no lack, no poverty. No harm, no hurt. Eden was just absolute goodness and glory. They were even covered with glory. That was their clothes. <laughs> Amen? The goodness of God and the glory of God and the grace of God and all of that, that's what they were living in. Now the Bible says in, in Genesis chapter 1, because what is the blessing? Genesis chapter 1, what is the blessing? It has to do with Eden. And, it has to, and that is what the gospel is all about. That is why you see the Lord must expand our thinking to, let, to rise up above the, relig with the religious ideas that we have had and come up higher into the realm of the Spirit of God where God wants to reveal unto us the things that He has always intended so that through us His power and His wisdom and His glory might be made known unto the angels and the principalities and powers. It is the will of God that through us, the whole earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord as water cover the sea. Amen? And we can, and that, that day makes no sense if you allow yourself to think in the lower realm of religion where things have been mixed up, where you've had a lot of mixture. It's time to come out of mixture. It is time, Jesus says, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. Revelation 3 verse 20, and it was talking about believers. He says, I'm standing, I'm outside the door, and I'm knocking. And there's only a handle on your side. If you would open the door, he says, I'll come in, and I will what? I will sup with you, which means what? That's a covenant term. I means I'll come in, and I'll, and I'll establish this covenant between me and you. I will come in and I'll take charge. I'm going to run the show. And I'm going to bring all the covenant blessings. And I'm going to make them a reality. If you as a believer would open the door and come into this type of relationship. Amen. And that is in Revelation 3 verse 2. And just a few verses after he says, I don't like this lukewarm stuff. Amen. So what is the blessing? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it says, God blessed them after he created man and them. God blessed them. The same word used when it says God, God preached the gospel to Abraham. And he blessed him. Remember? 
God bless them. God pronounced them, give them the blessing. And God said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish. Replenish means fill up. Fill up what the earth. Fill up the earth with what? With the glory. Make the whole, the garden. You see, farmers take seeds, plant it in the ground, and multiply the seed sown. Isn't that how it works? You give them a couple of oaks, seeds of oak, next thing you know, you have a whole field of oak trees. Well, the God, the Bible says the whole kingdom of God is as a man sowing seed. The Garden of Eden was supposed to be a seed in and of itself. And Adam was supposed to take the seed of the Garden of Eden and duplicate it throughout the entire earth. Can you imagine what it would have been like? You know what it would have been like? The whole earth would have been filled with the glory of the Lord as water covered the sea. And you know what? It's going to still happen. But you and I can get, up to get to be a part of that. Isn't that awesome? Anyway, so God says, God bless them and tell them, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish. Fill up the earth and subdue it. And have dominion. Amen? So that was what the blessing. That was the blessing right there. Now, you know what happened? Adam fell. And Adam lost the blessing. Adam fell. Adam lost the blessing. God had to shed blood of an animal to cover his nakedness and to cover his sin. God shed the blood. God provided a sacrifice. And that, that animal that was shed, that, that, that God had to kill to cover Adam's nakedness, was a type of Christ. Can you see that? But anyway, Adam lost the blessing. Anyway, Adam lost the blessing. Sin and wickedness begin to happen in the earth. And then God found a man named Noah. Genesis chapter 9. And Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah, same as the word again, and his sons. And said, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. So God continued that same covenant blessing with Noah. Amen? Now, and then, and then later on, you know the story... Um, uh, Noah had three sons. One of them, particularly Shem, did, did, did a lot of right. The other ones didn't do quite as well. But that blessing continued, and I also believe it continued specifically with the son Shem. Right? Now, and then this went on, and then what happened? We find it in Genesis chapter 14. After Abraham was coming back from the war against these kings, and he had won the war. The Bible says in verse 18 of Genesis 14 that Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine because Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High. Now, we don't know for sure, but I've heard, I've heard some ministers of the gospel with Revelation indicate that this could possibly have been Shem, which was Noah's son that was walking in the blessing. Either way, Melchizedek came and verse 9, and this is with Abraham, and he blessed him. What did he do? He blessed him. He, he evoked that, that same blessing. And he brought to Abraham wine and bread, which is a type of communion. And he blessed Abraham. So we see that blessing. So Abraham got a hold of the blessing. Amen? And then Abraham offered him tithes, indicating the connection between tithes and the blessing. Opened up the windows of heaven, etc. All right. So Abraham now walked in that. And then Abraham handed down that blessing to, to Isaac and to Jacob. There was a reason why parents used to lay hands on their children. Amen? And then that blessing went all the way to Joseph. And Joseph went into the Egypt. And it was that blessing that preserved Joseph in Egypt. That caused Joseph to be prosperous. And then the children of Israel, of course, you know, they went into captivity and so on and so forth. Now, now let me fast forward all the way to the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. Now, let me say a couple of things. Everything in the Bible, everything in the Bible from Genesis to Revelations points to Jesus and points to the cross. Amen? It's like there's a scarlet, you know, sometimes we have these little, this, this little red thread in our Bibles. That's significant because it's a sign. You should think of it as the scarlet thread of the blood of Christ that is throughout the Bible. From Genesis when God shed the blood, from Genesis when God said the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent, all the way through to the serpent in the wilderness that was a type of Christ, etc., etc., etc. It was all, and that is why we have to look for Christ, especially in the Old Testament, because in the Old Testament, Christ is concealed. He's hid. But in the New Testament, He's revealed. And the Spirit of God has come to reveal and uncover things in the Old Testament to us. Now, um, 
So, the Old Testament... All right, okay, let me let's just move quickly to this point. Here, the children of Israel were in Egypt. Amen? They were in Egypt. They were in captivity. And then God delivered them. Now, when God delivered them from Egypt... Did he deliver them from Egypt? You know, when the blood, the, the, when they had to take the blood of the lamb and they put it on the doorpost and the dead angel passed over them and they were delivered? Were they delivered because of obedience to the commandments? They didn't have no commandments. They were delivered, first of all, because of the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God to the grace covenant that he had with Abraham. Abraham had a covenant of grace. That is why God blessed Abraham in spite of himself. In the midst of his lying, God still blessed him. We saw that several weeks ago, isn't that right? And it is on basis of that covenant that God brought them out. What is going to happen later on, I think this is interesting. In the, old, in, in, um, the first time Moses, who is a type of the law, the law was given by? Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The first miracle that Moses performed was turning water into blood. Isn't that right? And that caused death. Exodus 7 verse 14 to 18. The first miracle that Jesus performed was turning water into wine. And that led to celebration and life. Do you see the difference? So God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now here's what I want to point out to you very quickly. God brought them out, not based on their behavior. God brought them out based on his own goodness and based on the covenant that he had with Abraham. Now all the way from Egypt, all the way to Sinai, listen to me, as he brought them out of Egypt, all the way, God manifested all the way from Egypt to Sinai, there was not one Israeli, there wasn't one person that even died. Not one person died. And all the way from Egypt to Sinai, what you see is a demonstration of pure grace, unmerited, undeserved favor. Even when they murmured, is murmuring a bad thing? Even when they murmured and complained. Let me just... Mention a couple of them. Number one, when they came to the Red Sea, in Exodus chapter 11, I believe it is, and you could write that down. When they came to the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army was behind them, they began to cry out, and they said, God, God, what happened? Uh, weren't there graves in Egypt that we could have died there? You bring us out here to kill us? Now, God could have said, oh, yeah, out of your mouth I will judge you, and you'll die right here. He didn't do that. What did he do? He divided the Red Sea, and they went over and go dry land. Is that right? And the enemies were drowned At a place called Mara, which is Exodus 15, verse 23 to 25, they ran into what they called bitter water. And the water was bitter. And again, they began to cry out, God, you brought us out here. I mean, we're here with this, this bitter water. What did God do? God turned the water into sweet water. I don't know what that tastes like, but that must have been good. Think about it. And that's what they got for their murmuring and complaining. Did they get what they deserved? No. Then later on in the wilderness, they got hungry. And they began to cry out, Oh God, we're hungry. You bring us out here to kill us with starvation. What did God do? God rained manna down from heaven. The Bible says in Psalm 78, verse 24 and 25, God fed them with angels' food. Did they deserve that? No, that's grace. And then, after that, they got thirsty, and they murmured again. And they said, God, you brought us out here to kill us and our livestock out here in the desert. Kill us with thirst. That's Exodus chapter 17. What did God do? God caused water to come out of the rock. Did they deserve that? No. But Israel, every murmuring up to Sinai, all of their murmuring and their griping, all they did is that it provoked God to produce some fresh demonstration of his goodness, his power, and his provision. Whoo, glory to God. Isn't that good? Isn't God good? All right. 
No, and it was not dependent on their goodness. It was not dependent on their obedience, but it was dependent on God's faithfulness and God's goodness to Abraham's covenant. All right. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 19. God was dealing with them. You see, while you're turning here, let me mention this. God deals with us according to covenant, according to his word, according to covenant. In the Old Testament, God says in Exodus 34 and I think verse 7, that I will by no means clear the guilty. And I'm going to visit the sin of the father to a second and third generation. Does it say that? But yet we see in, 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 we see in, in the new covenant in um, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 17, God says, I will not remember their sins and their trespasses anymore. And I'm not going to lay it to their charge. Isn't that the exact opposite? Has God changed? No, the covenant has changed. Amen? Now, let me show where this bad covenant came from. <laughs> Exodus chapter 19. Oh, you guys are there, I'm not. Now, Exodus chapter 19, verse 8. Now, the King James says, now here they were. I mean, they, I mean they're having it good. They murmur, they complain, they gripe. God bless them. God keep on blessing them just because he is good. But now, in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 8, and up until then, God used to hang out with them. The Bible says God was with them in a cloud by night and a, and, and a, a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. God was amongst them. Isn't that right? But verse 8, it says, The people answered together and said, All that the Lord had spoken, we will do. The Amplifies actually says, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Here is what happened. These people now turn to God and says, God, you have been blessing us and assessing us you've been blessing us based on your goodness but we want you to assess us and bless us based on our goodness and our obedience and whatever you tell us to do just tell us just give us the commands we are able to do it that's called pride that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and God said oh yeah they got him upset. So God said, all right, you want law? I'll give you law. And immediately in verse 12, God had to change. God talked to Moses and God said, no, you set some bounds onto the people and you tell them that if you just touch the border of this mountain, you'll die. Before God used to be with them, now they can't even come near. Do you see the tone change? God says they want law, and God give them law. It's dangerous to say, you know what, and to boast in the law and your ability to keep the law. The Bible says, let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he falls. I remember, for, uh, for those of you who have probably been around for a while, I remember ministers that have fallen in the past. And I remember a few specifically. And anybody who's been around, if they hear this tape, they'll be able to figure out some of whom talk, I've talked about, where they've preached law and they've preached fire and brimstone and they've preached law and they've preached this standard. And because, and, and, and they're making that boast and that prideful approach and next thing you know, bam, they get, they fall. The very thing that they are boasting that they are able to keep, give us the law, is the very thing that destroyed them. That is why you better be careful and watch your mouth. Say, watch your mouth. <laughs> Amen. You see, you got to trust in Jesus. Live from the tree of life, not from the tree of knowledge of good and evil based on your ability and how smart you are and how strong a willpower you have. And your, No, you got to learn to depend on Jesus and his grace. All right. So from that point on, from that point on, when they demanded the law, from that point on, you sin. From that point on, you murmur, you die. And from there on, what happened? They begin to die. Amen? Up until then, no one had even died, period, despite all of that. So you can see why the Bible calls 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 and 9 says, The law is a ministry of death, and it's a ministry of condemnation. Amen? We don't have time, but the Bible says, and so that's the way it was, and that is why the law went on. And God, through Jesus, Jesus came and fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law, filled the... Um, met all the standards of the law, took the punishment 
and the chastisement and the wrath of God that was necessary for the breaking of the law. Jesus took it all upon himself. And when you accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, you are delivered from the law, delivered from the consequences, and you become married to Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 18 and 19, how God got rid of the law. He disannulled it because he found it unfruitful and he found that it, it wasn't able to do the job. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7, 8, and 13 say the same thing. We don't have time to go there. Amen? But now, I want to show you a little bit further this issue about how God sees this issue of the law. How God sees this whole, this, how God sees our sins. Is sin bad? I sin caused the death of Christ. Sin is evil. Amen? Sin is the devil's fingerprint. God don't like sin, but the power of, over sin comes from grace, not from the law. Comes from right, from right thinking, from right believing, not from, not, not, from, not from willpower. Now, turn with me to Psalms 132. Have you ever heard, and, and, and I'm sharing this, I'm going to share with you a little bit about the Ark of the Covenant, and I want you to see God's attitude. Amen? Amen. So you see where the law came from? Who demanded it? Whose idea was it? Was it God's idea? No. <laughs> it's just like when they say, give us a king. Give us a king. We want a king like all the other nations. God says, you get a king, they're gonna, he's going to enslave you. They say, I don't, we don't care. We want a king. Just like all the other heathen nations. God says, you want a king? I'll give you king, tall king, handsome king. And you know what happened. Man, that caused them trouble. Just like the law. God's way is higher than our way, isn't it? <laughs> Amen? Hallelujah. All right. Psalms 132. Let's ask this question. You've heard it asked, said that David was a man after God's heart. Amen? I, 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 and if I were to ask everyone here, why did the Bible says David was a man after God's heart? I'm going to probably get some answers. Like, um, well, because David, when he, well, you know, Psalms 51, when David sinned, how David repented and he repented so thoroughly and how David refused when he had opportunity to kill Saul, even though Saul was trying to kill him, he didn't kill him and, and, and he was so honorable. And those are nice answers. But they're not necessarily the truth. David was a man after God's own heart. It could not be because of his a repentance where Bathsheba was concerned. Because that was said about David long before the Bathsheba incident, in, 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 um, incident ever took place. He's a man after his own heart. So that knocks out that repentance line. You follow me? But Psalms 132 gives us a hint. And I don't want to read the whole thing because, but let me just read from verse 3. He says, I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor am I going to go into my bed, I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a habitation of the mighty God of Jacob. Until I find a place for God to rest, I will not sleep. In other words, there is something, he says, I need to find a habitation for God and I'm not going to allow my eyes to sleep or slumber to come to my eyelids. What was it? What was this about? Here is, here is a clue. He says, lo, we heard of it in Ephrath, and we found it in the fields of the wood, the, the, uh, which is a place called Kiryat Jir Jirarim. You see what happened? There was this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was taken into captivity by the enemy, and it was lost from the children of Israel for 20 years. David, who grew up in Ep e e e Ephrath, grew up knowing about the Ark. Saul didn't do anything to go get the Ark, but David was concerned. He wanted the Ark to come back to Jerusalem. If you drop down to verse 13, it says, For the Lord had chosen Zion. Why did the Lord choose Mount Zion as opposed to Mount Sinai? Because Mount Sinai was a type of, 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 of um, the law and spiritual death, whereas Mount Zion is, was a type. Mount Zion, by the way, that's when the Holy Ghost came in the upper room, Jerusalem. Amen? At Mount Sinai, 3,000 people died. At Mount Zion, 3,000 people lived. So God preferred that. Now, and, and David wanted to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. And it was so important to him. Why was it so important? Why did this? And, why, and that is the reason why God says this is a man after my own heart. That sees things my way. That is filled with my passion. Here is what it is. Think of it this way. At that time, the holiest country in all the world 
was what? Israel. Is that right? The holiest city in all the world was Jerusalem. The holiest place in all the world was the temple. The holiest place in the temple. Now in the temple, you had the outer court. Then you have the inner court, which, is the, which was the holy place. And then you had the holiest of holies. So the holiest of holiest, that was the most holy spot on the entire planet. And in the holiest of holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant, you could think of it as this box. And there were three items inside the Ark of the Covenant. Number one, there was a, there was a copy of the, of the law, the Ten Commandments. What was that symbolic of? The commandments was the symbolic of the fact of, of the people's rebellion and the people's inability to keep God's command, the broken commandments. The second thing in there was, it was Aaron's rod that budded. When they rebelled against Aaron and said, well, who does Aaron think he is that he's going to run the show and he's going to be in charge? Who, who made him this ruler? God says, well, I'm going to show you that he's the one I've chosen. And, God, and he had a, a rod. And God caused the rod that he had to bud and to give flowers and to bear fruit. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? God says, now you're going to mess with my leadership? You better think about it. <laughs> So that rod was in there, Aaron's rod was in that Ark of Covenant, indicating, the, the, it, again, it was, an indi it was a reminder of the people's rebellion against God-appointed leadership. The third thing that was in there was the manna. Oh, would I have loved to have seen some of that. And the, uh, by the way, the manna used to, to, to melt after a day in the, covenant, in the Ark of the Covenant, it didn't. Because in the presence of the Lord, nothing dies. Hallelujah. Anyway, the manna was in, the manna, which is, called, what's that, was the meaning of it. The manna, now that manna, these children of Israel called it, a, called this worthless bread. This was a type of Christ, they called it worthless. And this was angel food. So it was a sign of the rebellion against God's provisions. Now, this was inside of this box, inside the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark was this, was this cover which was called the mercy seat, made out of pure gold that was beaten into shape, symbolizing Christ and his deity that Jesus had was literally beaten into shape for you and I, the punishment and the wrath of God that he took. And then that mercy seat covered everything in the covenant and blood was sprinkled on it. The blood was symbolic of the blood of Christ. So that when God looked, instead of seeing man's rebellion and inability to keep his law, and man's rebellion against his leadership and his authority, man's rebellion against his, his miraculous provision, instead of seeing that, God would see it covered by the mercy seat and covered by the blood of Christ. Can you see that? So the ark was a type of Christ. Now you and I, and that is why you see you and I, uh, uh, oh yes, that's good too. Yeah, that is the reason why you and I need to see ourselves in Christ. We are all our sins and all our shortcomings and all our rebellion is covered. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Glory to God. God must want you to see this. Hmm. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, oh that, that doesn't help. Praise you, Lord, praise you, Lord, praise you, Lord. 1 Samuel 6, verse 19, I'm sorry. Now, 1 Samuel 6, verse 19, here was the situation. I'm just jumping straight to verse 19. Are you there? 1 Samuel 6, verse 19. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they did what? They look into the ark. You know what they did? They lift up the cover. And what are they looking at? Broken sins. They're peeking at the sins. And for lifting up the cover and exposing sin. You see, in the Old Testament, the prophets were called to give, to bring people's sins to remembrance. But in the New Covenant, the prophets are called to point out, to let the people know that they are righteous in Christ. Amen? 
So they lifted it up, and as a result, 50,060 and 70 people died. What did they die for? For uncovering that box. Here's my point. Lifting up the mercy seat. The point being, God's attitude towards sins is that he wants it covered. That is why he says, I'm going to make a new covenant with them. I'm going to write my laws in their heart. And their sins and iniquities, I will remember it no more. I'm not going to impute it to them because I've perfected them forever because of the blood of Christ and the mercy seat. That is why when you and I make mistakes and we mess up, we can still come boldly to the throne of grace because of the mercy seat of God and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you see that? Amen? Amen. And, and, and I have to wrap this up. But it says, the mercy seat is above all of that. It's above those broken laws. It's above the judgment of God. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 17, that mercy triumphs over judgment. God prefers mercy than judgment. In fact, God's judgment was even, even had mercy in it. The judgment of God against us is that he poured it out on Jesus. That's mercy. Think about it. Amen? Think about it. So, but the whole point is, if you see, so David was a man after God's heart because he saw things the way God did and he brought the ark back into the center. He brought Jesus into the center. One of the problems with the church today that is causing the lack of the manifestation of the power of God is because we've pushed Jesus off to the side and we want to teach psychology. We want to talk about our vision. Amen? We want to talk about principles. And principles are good. Vision is important. These things are important. We want, to, you know, we want to have motivational speeches so the folks can go and do this. And we have forgotten. And instead of, uh, of church being, every time you come to church, you ought to see something more about Jesus. There ought to be a greater revelation of who he is. And as you see who he is, then you see who God has made you on the inside. And the Bible says you are changed from glory to glory by the revelation of Christ. When you can see and you can awake to who you are in him, that gives you the power to overcome. Now, I'm going to wrap this up very quickly. Let me give you a couple of things. The gospel is the power of God. Well, let me flip it around. The power of the gospel is what? Number one, God is not angry at you anymore. God said in Isaiah 54 verse 9 and 10, I will not be angry or wrought at thee anymore. God cannot be angry at you. You see, we have this schizophrenic thinking that today God please, uh, please God and I do something bad and I, God is angry. And we have this image of God as this angry person. Hey, God is pleased at you. You're in Christ. You're in the ark. Hallelujah. The whole revelation of the gospel is the fact that I am righteous 24 hours a day. Every moment of every day there is no condemnation. And I am pleasing to him in Christ. And that gives me confidence. That frees me from every sin consciousness. There is no consciousness of separation from me and God. Amen? So there is no anger towards me. So, because you see, when you get a wrong idea, you're robbed of the intimacy. Your sin and the condemnation pushes you away rather than recognizing that I can run into my father's arm, even if I've been a prodigal son. There is perfect forgiveness. The forgiveness is not based on your repentance. The forgiveness is not based on how, on how well you confess your sins. The forgiveness is based according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1 verse 7. And the moment you get born again, all your sins are forgiven, all of them. And you live from faith to faith, not from confession to confession. First John 1 John 1.9 that says if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness is written to unbelievers. People that had no fellowship with God. People who are habitually living in the, who are in the kingdom and the realm of darkness. And Paul was saying to them, you need to repent. You need to confess your sins so that you could come out of there. Amen? But as for you and I, what does it say? It says, you, you, my little children, 1 John 2, 1, you've got an advocate with the Father. So that even if you sin, you've got an advocate. Jesus, the righteous one. And as he is, so are you. You are still righteous. Amen? And what it does say in 1 John 1, 7, is that if you walk, if you are living in the realm of light, if you walk in the light, not walk according to the light, if you belong to the kingdom of light, 
Then what would happen? That the blood of Jesus, like a waterfall, is flowing all the time so that even when you sin, before you could even confess it, it cleanses you from all unrighteousness. Amen? Now, and as a matter of fact, here's, a, here's an awesome scripture. Now, I encourage you, go back and read the first epistle of John completely. And bear in mind that in the kingdom of... That in light is not the same as according to light. It's talking about the realm of light. And you will also find it talks about a brother, brother, brother. And, some, and the Amplified many times translates it as brother in Christ, and it's not brother in Christ. Let me give you an example. 1 John 3 verse 14 says, We know that we've passed from dead unto life because we love the brethren. That means the brother in Christ. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. That means he's not born again. And whosoever... Hated his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer had eternal life abiding in him. That tells you that the word brother is not necessarily being born again. You follow me? Anyway, I got to fast, fast forward, so let me go past that. You no, know, I'm not going to bother, because I, I won't be able to deal with all this stuff. So let me finish at this point here. Let me just mention two other points. Number one, there, is there a problem with sin? Of course there's a problem with sin. Sin has been dealt with. Amen? Sin has been dealt with. However, we, as believers, the, and this is, what we, this is what we need to understand. We don't have to confess our sins to be forgiven. We are already forgiven. But what happens sometimes is that when you, when, when, when you stray away from God, when you don't spend time in the Word, when you don't spend time in prayer, there is a sense of, 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 of unrighteousness that comes on you. And in order to get rid of that, you need to just go and get yourself washed in the Word. In order to do that sometimes, uh, because you see, God, there is at no time you're supposed to have a sin consciousness. Because a sin consciousness is, is dishonoring to the blood, is dishonoring to the cross. It creates a separation between you and God. It produces condemnation, which opens the door to sickness. It makes you self-focus. But having said that, what happens is, you still need to maintain. Paul says, I exercise myself to keep a conscience that is void of offense. So I want to remain sensitive. I can't afford to go sinning left, right, and center because it will mar my conscience. It will make me insensitive to the Spirit of God. And when God tried to direct me, I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't hear. And the way you walk in this new covenant is by following the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And if you're spiritually deaf, you wouldn't hear it. So what happened? You can't go practicing sin. And besides, for the, anyone that practices sin, lacks a revelation of of, of, of uh, lacks a revelation, first of all, of the grace of God. Because if he has a revelation of the grace of God, sin will not have dominion over him. So the person who, has a do who is dominated by sin needs a great... What do you preach to him? More law? No. He needs a revelation of the grace of God. He needs to awake to righteousness and who he is. He needs to learn how to surrender and yield to the Spirit of God and let the Holy Spirit guide him. Because the Holy Spirit will never guide him into sin. You follow me? Amen? Hallelujah. Anyway, praise the Lord. I'm going to end. We got to end. That's it. We are the time. But let me just say this one thing in closing. Right where we start. We don't want to be the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. And our responsibility is to believe. The gospel is pure. It's pure grace. It's righteousness. It is a gift. And it has the ability to produce salvation, the blessing of the Lord, and all of it. But we must not nullify and nullify and cancel out the gospel by allowing mixture of law. And let that be your basis. Because I've served the Lord, or because I've done this obedience, or because I've done this, therefore I expect God to do this or that for me. No. God will do whatever he is for you because of the obedience of Christ, which is symbolized in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is what has qualified us. In the time to come, I, I, I plan on, uh, on, on opening up some more and, uh, so that we can see where this mixture comes from. Because for many of us, we have been contaminated by it over the years. But it's time to be decontaminated. Amen? So that we can walk uprightly. In the gospel of grace. The Bible says when you walk uprightly in the truth of the gospel, then what will happen? 
God will give grace and glory, and there is no good thing that he will withhold from them that walk uprightly in the truth of the grace. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The gospel is the power of God. It can produce anything you need. You don't need anything else. The Bible says it's exceedingly abundant. Let's stand.